Hi guys, Mr. Roden here. I'm coming from you from actually home tonight, I, uh, Sunday night, and uh, you guys have an asynchronous lesson tomorrow, and uh, I didn't get my asynchronous lesson uh, made at school. So, right at home, the best part of uh, distance learning or remote learning is you can do it wherever you want. Wish I was kind of like at the beach maybe or fishing, and I could be doing this in remote lesson, but no, I'm, gonna, I'm in my office here at home. Okay, so our um, learning target today is I can apply deductive reasoning to solve problems. And our agenda is good thing, because it's me, uh, warm up, homework bucket, and lesson 4.1b. And let me do this, because I always forget to go to the homework bucket. I'm gonna go to the homework bucket after my good thing. So I'm gonna do my good thing, and then I'm gonna go to the homework bucket, and then I'm going to, then we'll start the warm up. Okay, awesome. So my good thing is, um, let's see here. So I saw you guys on Thursday, Thursday last, I believe. So my good thing is that on Thursday, my daughter uh, ran in a cross country meet downtown um, and she qualified for state because she got second or fourth place in her region, which is pretty good because there was, let's say 90, 95 kids or something there. So fourth, fourth out of 95 is Pretty darn good. So I was excited for her and she gets to run in state. So that is my good thing. Hopefully you have a good thing. And I will, maybe when I see you tomorrow, because I think we see you guys tomorrow, you guys will have a, had a good weekend and you'll have a good thing to share with me. All right. So let's look at the homework bucket really quick, shall we? All right. So the homework bucket, let me do this. I got a lot of hair. Let me see here. Let's see if I can find it here. Go through that. Got all these tabs open here. All right, so let's go to your course. Uh, courses, geometry, and Schoology is currently unavailable. Well, that's not good. Well, look at your homework bucket because your assignment is 12, oh, excuse me, 1-4, and it's in the homework bucket, but Schoology is not available. Hopefully they'll have that fixed by the time you guys get on tomorrow. My guess is they, on Sunday nights, it's Sunday night, they kind of do a bunch of maintenance and stuff on it. All right, let's go back to this. Okay, so look at your homework bucket. It's 12, excuse me, I keep saying 12, one dash four. Should be the one geometry home, one dash four in your homework bucket. I'll be grading uh, the other two, um, one, uh, one, two, and one, three. I'll be putting those in the grade book today, which is, well, Monday, which is tomorrow, okay? All right, so let's do a quick warm up here. Um, let's see here. Let me, uh, let me see here if I can get to that. I can't get to my warm up because I was going to do geometry tools. So let's do this. Um, the warm up. What I want you to do on the warm up is I want you to tell me um, one reason for something to be true in geometry. So right now for a warm up because I was going to do a construction but my construction page is not available on Schoology. So here's we'll we'll shift gears, we'll change here. I want to know um let's do this as many reasons as many reasons you can think of for um, um, for a reason in geometry. It's kind of a long, not a very good sentence. Okay, so what are some good things we can um, we can say that are true that are logical reasons? Now remember, when we met last, we talked about two kinds of reasoning, deductive reasoning, and um, inductive reasoning. And remember, geometry is mainly an in, induct, or excuse me, deductive reasoning class. So let's get some reasons here. So right now I want you to pause the video and then I want you to write down as many reasons for, um, for a good, all the logical reasons you can use in geometry that we have so far, okay? And I, those are in your notes. So look at your notes because they should be there. Here, pause right now, right? Okay, so welcome back. Let's see about some reasons. So most obvious reason is given. Okay, we gotta start somewhere. We can't just start from nowhere. Geometry needs to have something given, okay? We could have definitions. We 
we could have postulates. We could have um, uh, properties. We could have theorems, which are really important. We could have, um, because Mr. Roden said so. No, that's, I was fooling you there. You can't, Mr. Roden said so. I am not a logical reason in geometry. So hopefully you didn't write that down. Uh, let's see here, what else do we have? Properties, we have constructions. So, oh, and so we have givens, we have definitions, we have postulates, we have properties, we have theorems, we have constructions. We also have the non-defined um, th objects like points, lines, and planes. Points, lines, and planes. We can use those for, um, because remember those are non-defined. Non, and I didn't know if I put you in defined terms can use those also. Those are the three non-defined terms we have, okay? And then there could be more as we go. I can think of a few more right now, but I'm not gonna add those to it. You will add those along the way when we get there. So this is a lot of different cool things we can use to prove things are true. Now, when we're dealing in geometry, remember, so this is your warm up. So this was your warm up. Hopefully you wrote that down. So now let's kind of review a little bit. So let's review what we talked about. So remember, in geometry, we need to have something called a conditional statement. Oftentimes, when we're using logical reasoning, we need to have something called a conditional statement. Conditional statement. Now, what is a conditional statement? Okay, a conditional statement is a statement that is in the form if A then B, or oftentimes we say if, if P then Q, that seems to be the most common type. If P then Q, if P then Q. Now, so I'm gonna get rid of this F, if A then B, because usually P and Q are more commonly used. It doesn't really matter, but this is the more commonly used notation. So remember what P is. P is what we call the hypothesis. Hypothesis, hypothesis. And Q is called the conclusion. And a, a, a conditional statement is normally assumed to be true. So every time the hypothesis is true, then the conclusion must also be true. So what I want you to do right now is we have these, um, these two statements right here, um, and they are, all zebras are genus equius, genus equius, the biology term there. So I want you to write that one in, well, well I, I'll, how about this? I'll write this one for you as a conditional statement, and you have to write the little, the next one is a conditional statement, okay? All right, so here's how I'd write this. All zebras belong to genius equus. So here we go. So I'm gonna say if something is a zebra, so we're setting it, if something is a zebra, then it, belongs to genus, which is just a category of, in biology, like species, genus, all that. Genus equus, okay? So if something is a zebra, then it belongs to genus equus. Now, one other thing, you don't have to do this, but just remember this right here, this part right here, let me make it thick. This is kind of so thin right now. This part right here, if something is a zebra, that is our hypothesis. That's our hypothesis. All 
hypothesis. H, sorry, I'm going to spell that right. H Y P O T H I S I S. Okay, hypothesis. And this right here, this part of our conditional statement right here, then it belongs to genus Equus. That is our conclusion. So every conditional statement in geometry should be able to be written as a conditional statement in the form if P, then Q. Okay? All right. So don't do this part yet. So don't worry about the deductive reasoning to solve this equation. All right. So the bill will pass if two-thirds the bill will pass if it gets two-thirds of a vote in the Senate. Okay, that's interesting because now we're talking about a little bit about government. So it has nothing to do with geometry here, but we can actually apply conditional statements to this. So your job right now is to go ahead and write the conditional statement, write this statement, a bill will pass if it gets two-thirds of the vote in the Senate into a conditional statement. Okay, so pause, go ahead and do it. Welcome back. All right, so here we go. So the bill, if, uh, let's see here. So if, um, if a bill passes, then it will get two thirds, I'm just gonna write as a fraction, two thirds of the vote in the Senate. And that's how I'm going to say, um, that's how I'm going to say this is a conditional statement. If a bill passes, so there's your hypothesis, a bill passes, then it will get two thirds of the vote in the Senate. And that's your conclusion. Okay. All right. So this next one, we want to use deductive reasoning. Let me stretch this down a little bit. I don't know if I can stretch this down. This might not work here. Okay. So I think I have to cram this in. I want to use deductive reasoning to solve the equation. Okay. So Here's how I like to do deductive reasoning. Let's see if we can do it this way. So we have, I'm going to kind of make this over here. I'm going to recopy this to give myself a little more. We have 3x, 3 minus 4x equals negative 5. Now, where did I get this from? This is a given. So I'm just going to write off to the side. That's a given right there. Okay. I was given this equation. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is now I'm going to go back up. Remember reasons and geometry. I'm going to use something called properties, okay, properties, and these are going to be algebra properties. There's a lot of different kinds of properties, but I'm going to use the properties of algebra, and those are fair game for us in geometry, okay? So now I'm going to go use my, this is just a given because it's just given to me in the problem. Now I'm going to go ahead and start to manipulate this equation and solve for x using my algebra properties. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's see here. I'm going to rewrite this as negative 4x equals negative 8. Okay? So what's the reason that allowed me to do that? Okay, the reason that allowed me to do that was the addition, or in this case, maybe it was subtraction, property, I'm abbreviating here, of equality. So all I did was subtract 3 from both sides. Okay, and then what's the next step? So I'm now I'm going to get x equals, um, in this case, I believe I'll get positive 2. And what allowed me to do that? Well, yeah, that's a piece of cake. That was the, um, that was the division property of equality. And I'm done. All right, so what I want you to do now is I want you to identify, this is your example, Right in this box, I kind of showed you a few here. I want to know what property each one of these are using. Okay, so those in your notes from last Thursday, I believe, we took notes on this. So your job is to go ahead 
and tell me what property each one have missed. So pause the video and we'll check back with you in a second. All right, so welcome back. Hope you had a good chop. So let's take a look at this. So if X equals two, then two X equals four. So what did we do to both sides? We started with X equals two. So, and then we, we got two X equals four. So what did we do? Well, yeah, we just multiplied both sides of the equation by two. So this is the multiply multiplication. So I'm just gonna say M-U-L-T property of quality. All right, if five equals three A, then three A equals five. So what's happening here? The only difference in this equation right here, guys, is that the five is on the left here and it's on the right here. The three A is on the right here and it's the left here. So what property is that? That is the symmetric property of equality, okay? Uh, what's this one? So if t equals 4, then 5t plus 7 equals 27. So what did they do here? They plugged in, they replaced the value of t with 4 because they were told that t is 4. And then they just did a bunch of, they did their order of operations and got 27. Well, what's that? Well, that's just substitution. Okay. All right. So what's the next one? Um, if nine equals four X and four X equals M, then nine equals M. So remember, what's this one? It's, this is kind of like the whole, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So you cut out the middleman, right? The middleman in this case is B, right? So if A equals B and B equals C, then you can just cut out the B's all together and just say A equals C. Well, what, what property is that? Well, that is the transitive property. Transitive property, and I think that's of equality. And you're done. Cool. Awesome. Well, let's move on. Okay, so another thing I want to talk about here is something called a linear pair. Now, there's a theorem here, and we'll talk maybe on uh, tomorrow about the about the kind of the uh, proof behind it, because this is a theorem, and we haven't done a lot of theorems yet. In fact, this may be the first theorem that we do. So remember, guys, a theorem needs a proof, okay? So, but I'm not going to do the proof with you now. I might do it tomorrow. So if you remind me, I will. we can take a look at what the proof looks like, okay? So recall that two angles whose measure our 180 is called supplementary. So now this is a review. So make sure you write this down. So we'll, and here in math and geometry, when we talk about supplementary angles, supplementary angles. Okay, so supplementary is really big. We need to know this word. And so hopefully you remember this word back from your days in, it's a geometry nugget you had way back in the day. But here's the deal. If you didn't remember it, supplementary are two angles. Now remember, it's two, not three, not 12, not six. Two angles whose sum is 180. When you add their measures up, they equal 180. So you could have, let's say, you could have a 100 degree angle over here. If this is a 100 degree angle, Okay, and if you had another degree angle over here, let's say this is an 80 degree angle. Okay, so you know that this is angle A and this is angle B. Then angle A is supplementary to angle B because 100 plus 80, if these are degrees, equals 180, right? So remember what supplementary means. It means 180 degrees. Now, what's the whole thing about a linear pair? Well, a linear pair, ladies and gentlemen, is a very special kind of a linear pair is a very special kind of supplementary angles in which they're kind of connected to each other by a ray in the middle. And so that's kind of what this whole thing is here. A, a pair, a linear pair is a pair of adjacent angles. Now, adjacent means they share a common side. OK, so adjacent in geometry means they share a common side. So if this, let me just kind of, put, let me put some letters there. So if this is A and this is B here, this is point B, this is C here, and this is D here. Now you can name an angle by just numbers inside it, or 
you can see that angle A, B, C, and angle D, B, C, they share this common side of ray B, C. So adjacent angles are angles who share a ray. Now, a linear pair is a pair of adjacent angles whose non-common sides are opposite rays, okay? Okay, so what does that mean now? What does it mean their non-common sides are opposite rays, okay? Well, the common side here is BC, right? But their non-common sides are of these two angles are the ones that they don't share. Angle three and angle four do not share side BD and BA, but those are opposite angles, which means they shoot in the exact opposite direction, okay? In other words, the way we can say this part right here is they make a line. They form a line. What do you mean by that, Mr. Roden? It means that this, when you have opposite rays going in different directions, it means they're shooting off in different directions. Let me just undo that because I think I have a better idea. So if you do this AB goes this way, and then BD goes the exact opposite way, when that happens, when those two non-adjacent sides are shooting opposite directions, they make a line, okay? So basically what it's saying is when you take angle four and angle three and add them up, you get a straight line from here to here but it means they're also supplementary. So we can say that the measure of angle four and measure of angle three plus the measure of angle four equals 180 degrees. They're supplementary. And that's what a linear pair is, okay? So let me just kind of review this. These two angles are not linear pairs. They're supplementary, but they're not linear pairs because they don't share a common ray. These two, I'll draw one here. These two would be, so let's say, um, let me do this. These two rays would be, so this is, let's call this um, angle one and angle two here. Angle one and angle two, not only are they supplementary because when they form, they're going to form a straight line here because this should be a straight line. I didn't draw it perfectly, but they're a linear pair because they, they form a straight line, but they also share a common ray in the middle there. Okay, see that? So that's what a linear linear pair is, and we'll be using that a lot this year. So remember, one fact about linear pairs is they're supplementary, okay? They're supplementary. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at this problem right here, and I want you to see if you can't solve for X, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to go through, and I want you to solve, write an equation, and I want you to solve for X. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back, and then we're going to make some deductive reasonings why we were able to do that. So I want you, all I want you to do is just solve for X. So use your algebra skills write equations and just go down and solve for x. So pause the video and solve. Hey, welcome back. Let's get, let's see how you did. So probably the first thing you did was you said, okay, x plus two plus at three x minus eight is equal to five x minus 12, okay? That's probably the first thing you did. Because you can see this part plus this part equals the whole part. Now, why is that true? So now let's put a reason behind that. Okay, let me put my reasons in blue right here. The reason behind that is angle addition, po no, excuse me, segment addition and postulate. Segment addition postulate. And I'm abbreviating here. I'm abbreviating a plus sign for addition. Segment addition postulate. Why are we able to use segment addition postulate on this? So because the two parts equal the whole, right? That's what segment addition postulate means. You add up the two parts of the segment, in this case, and we know it's the whole. Now, we don't know S is a midpoint. It doesn't tell us that, but we don't need to know that. We just know that X plus 2 plus 3X minus 8 equals 5X minus 12. Segment addition postulate. Okay? So what's the next thing I can do? Well, I could rewrite this. Hopefully what you did after this is you could rewrite this as 4X um 4x my, my, my thing is turning so i can't wait for it to stop here uh let's go so what do we got 4x minus 6 equals 5x minus 12 okay so why were we able to write it like that well that my friends is substitution Substitution is, we know that you can sub 4x minus 6 is the same thing as x plus 2 plus 3x minus 8. They just simplify into that. 
And so we can substitute this equivalent expression in for this more complicated one. We're just simplifying, okay? Sound good? Okay, what's the next step? Um, let me see here. So let me write it out here. We could say this is negative. I, mean, I want this in red. Negative 6 equals, uh, what do we got here? X plus, excuse me, minus 12. Okay, why were we able to say that this is negative 6 equals X minus 12? Well, that, what I did is I just subtracted 4X from both sides. I just subtracted 4X from both sides. And so that is the subtraction property of quality. Okay. All right. So what's next? Uh, the next thing is, what do I get here? I get 6 equals x. Okay. And why do I have that? Well, that is the addition property of equality. I just added 12 to both sides. Negative 6 plus 12 is positive 6. And just to be fancy, you could probably stop there, but what if I did something like this? What if I did this? This is always fun. Try this. X equals 6 because this is more of the common, this is more of the common uh, way to write it. Usually X on the left instead of X on the right. Why can I do that? Why, what allows me, what property allows me to do that? Well, yeah, that's just the symmetric property of equality. And I'm done. So you could stop there, but it's fun using symmetric property sometimes, guys. I just really like it. Okay, cool. All right, so your job, ladies and gentlemen, is I get this problem for you. I want you to solve for X, and I want you not only to solve for X, but I want you to give a logical reasoning why you're doing it the whole time. So ready? One, two, three, go pause. Solve the video. Hey, welcome back. All right, so let's see what we can do here. So the first thing that you probably did, or hopefully you did, you wrote the equation. Like I'm, what I'm doing, I'm trying to color code this a little bit, guys. So I'm gonna I'm gonna write the the work in red and the reason in blue. Okay. So here we go. So I get x plus twenty five plus five x plus ten equals fifteen x minus 10. Okay. Now, why was I able to write it like that? Well, notice this angle plus this angle equals the entire big angle. That's given right there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is called angle addition postulate. So I'm going to use this for my angle symbol. So angle addition postulate. How do you like that for abbreviating? Angle addition postulate. I'm going to big time abbreviator not right now those are all those words okay so let's do the next one well what do we have here we have we can rewrite this as what uh, let me write this in right here so we could say 6x uh, plus 35 equals 15x minus 10 and why was I able to do that well that is just substitution 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 because x plus 5x is 6x i can substitute a 6x in for x plus 5x and i can substitute a 35 in for 25 plus 10. all right so what's next after that but you can figure that one out hopefully you did already uh we could do this we could say um let's see here we could say 35 equals 9x minus 10. And why were we able to do that? Well, all I did was subtract 6x from both sides. And 6x minus 6x is 0x, which I didn't write. And 15x minus 6x is 9x. And so that was substitution. All right, what's the next one? Uh, let's see here. So now I could say 45 equals 9x. And so what did I do there? I simply just added 10 to both sides. So that's, and by the way, this is not substitution. I apologize. You're probably freaking out on me right now, guys. Um, this was not substitution. This was 
what would what did I do here? I added 10 to both sides. Oh no, 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 I didn't add 10. I subtracted six from both sides, right? So this is the subtraction. Sorry, it's getting late, guys. I'm getting tired, but property of coulomb. So that was a subtraction property because I subtracted 6x from both sides. All right, and this one is the addition, right? Addition property of equality because I simply just added 10 to both sides. And the last one here, we change my color here. So we get, um, what do we get here? We get uh, five equals X. And why is that? Well, that's just the division property of equality. And then if I wanted to get fancy and put the X on the left side, which I absolutely do not need to do, but sometimes that's fun. I could get X equals five. So then that is going to be the symmetric property of quality. I don't want to write on my face here, guys. That would be, that would just be bad, right? Okay. All right, cool. Hopefully you got that. Did you get that? Are those, did those, did those answers seem, those, does that work? And re, those blue reasons seem to be jiving with what you have. Okay. Let's talk postulates, guys. There's some postulates that we want to know um, before. It's, okay. So the first thing, now remember what a postulate is. A postulate is a obviously true statement. That's the best way to think of a postulate. Unprovable, but obviously true. True enough. It's so obviously true that we're going to actually say that it's just a true statement and we're going to always use it. Now, let's talk about some postulates, and I want you to write these down. So the first one we have is through any two points, there is exactly one line. Okay. So that's the first one. And that looks pretty mean, you know, that's pretty reasonable. So if you have two points, if you have a point A here, and it doesn't matter where the other point B is, the only way to get, the only thing you can do is only get one unique line through there. Okay. There's no way. So if I have this line right here, okay, this line right here, this is the, if I can actually get it through there, this line right here is the only Still working on this one note stuff, guys. I, I'm used to my it's workspace. So that line right there, if it goes exactly through A and B, this is the only line that's going to go through A. This line right here, we could call it line M or whatever. This is the only line that's going to go through A and B. There's no other line that exists that can go through A and B. Okay, that's not exactly the same as this line, this blue line right here. Okay. All right. So through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane that contains them. So if you have just three random points, okay, they can't be linear. There's only one flat surface that you can get it through, okay? Like this screen right here that I'm writing on, this is the flat surface that contains this, let's say C, D, E. That's the only, this screen is the only flat surface that can, can those three points. Now, if I was some way able to magically go, and this is me trying to grab it off, I could magically grab E and bring it off into space, then there's only one plane, another plane that can cut through and get those three points. Did you guys see that? Cool. Awesome. All right. What's the next one? If two points lie in the plane, then the line containing those points lies in the plane. So if you have two points on a plane, okay, and then you've got that line going through that, just kind of try to draw that line, not a great line, but hopefully you see that. So we have this line that's going through these two points. We'll call this H and L, okay? This line, and this think about the plane that's containing these two points, guys. It's my screen I'm writing on, right? It's a flat surface that's containing. There's lots of other points on this plane, okay? So all these points are on this plane that I'm writing right here, but this line that contains these two points here is also on this flat surface. It doesn't, it can't come off the, it can't come off the screen. It can't go through the wall or anything like that. So it's stuck there. Okay, here's a big one. If two lines intersect 
if two lines intersect, then they intersect exactly at one point, okay? So that's pretty interesting. So when you have two lines, okay? So let me just see, I think I can actually do, okay? If you have two lines, you have this line right here, and let me change the color, and you have this line right here. Uh, let me change the color. Got these two lines. Okay, so what, what we're saying here is when these two lines cross, they're going to cross at a point. So if this is A, and this is B, and this is C, and this is D, okay, they're going to cross at one point. So there's a, there's a point right here, a point of intersection. Maybe we call this E. Now, here's what happens a lot is we don't even actually have to put the dot. We just can know it's there. So what will happen a lot when you, when you get into geometry, they'll have like lines crossing. And they may put a point here, let's say C, and they put a point D out here, and then E here, and then F here. They may put some dot, they'll have to put some dots on the line, but this thing right here, they might just call it G and they won't even put the dot because they'll assume that you know, we don't put stuff in geometry that we don't absolutely necessarily have to have. And yes, there's an imaginary dot right here, just like that, but we actually don't write it. Oftentimes, a lot of times we don't even put the dot. We just know there's a dot there, but we don't write it because it's not necessary because we know through this postulate right here that when two lines cross, if they cross at a point. So you don't even have to put the point. You only actually have to put the dot when you want to when you want to say right here is C, right here is D, right here is E, right here is F. You don't have to say right here is G because you know it's right there because that's where those two lines cross. Okay, so it's pretty interesting that you never actually have to write the dot. You can just write the letter when they cross. Okay, if two planes intersect, they intersect at a line. So if you take a two pieces of paper and you let me see if I can see it in my, in my picture here. There's a piece of paper and you and you take another piece of paper. And they're going to cut each other if you cut it, like cut a little slip in it and let the paper sit on it. Let's see if I can do that. Ah, I won't do it right now. It's hard to see this little screen right here. Then basically those two those two planes are going to intersect at a line. Okay. And those are, these are just the simple points, planes and point lines and planes postulates is basically what you get when you start co combining points with planes and lines and things like that. Okay. All right, so that is your lesson for today. Um, and now what I want you to do is I want you to go into your homework and I want you to go into 1.4 in your homework bucket. Let me check to see if Schoology's back up yet. Okay, let's do that. Let's refresh Schoology and see if they fixed it. Oh, Schoology's back up. So let's go into our homework bucket. All right, and our homework, I'm going to go ahead and publish this. Uh, I'll, publish, I'll publish it now. That's fine. And so you're going to do 1.4. Let's just take a look and make sure everything's good. There's 1.4 is pretty mellow. Okay, just, and so, and it's all those essay problems. Okay, guys, it's not multiple choice. These problems just don't get the job done in multiple choice. You do not need to send me your work through email. You should be able to do all your work here. Let's preview these really quick. If you, I'll start a new attempt. You should be able to do all your work within the box here, okay? Give a counterexample, all that. We talked about counterexamples. Identify hypothesis and conclusion of each statement. That should be pretty easy, and you're just going to write them in the box. Okay, use the definition of theory to find the value of X described. Okay, so you're going to use... You're going to follow the directions there. Um, you, so just follow the directions and then type in your answers inside the box. And that's what I'll be grading. It's just what you type in those boxes. Now, for this problem right here, it's asking one, two, five, and six. So please dot, just kind of note in here one equals this. What are the reasons? I want to have one, two, three, four reasons in the box here. Okay. Sound good? All right. So you guys have a wonderful day. Um, you know what he could do really quick, though? Uh, yeah, let's do it really quick because Schoology is open um, and this is a long class. So let me do one thing before we leave today. Um, let's go. I'm going to show you how to do something pretty cool here. So this is uh, extra and I want you guys to be able to do this. So don't do your homework yet. So I want to show you one thing before we leave today and it's a construction. So let me go to courses, geometry. Yes, leave the site. Uh, going to 
go down to your um, online geometry tools. And I wanted to show you one thing in, in school as you was down and I'm just doing this in real time. I'm not going to edit a bunch. So, all right. So here's the deal. I want to show, this is what your warm up I wanted you to do. Let's, I want to show you how you can bisect an angle. Now, what is a bisect? When you bisect an angle, you're cutting an angle in half and you're finding a ray that will cut an angle in half. So it's, it's pretty cool. Let me show you how I can do it. So let's say I have this angle like here, okay? And so this is your given angle right here, okay? And we're gonna call this, let me see if this pen is so terrible, but let me see if I can write. We're gonna call this, so this is a ray here. And then, and then it's gonna be, let's say here, we're gonna call this, all right. Okay, anyways, so my pen, this pen is just, it's not good. Let me use a mouse. Maybe the mouse will work better. So it's just so hard to write. So we'll call this. Okay, excellent. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my compass. And all I'm going to do, let me just undo some of this because get rid of that. All those little silly dots. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my compass and I'm going to put the needle on the vertex of the angle. Okay. Then I'm just going to grow my compass out and I'm just going to open it up, you know, good chunk, doesn't matter. And then I'm going to go ahead and lock my compass and then I'm just going to make an arc. Again, we don't have to make a circle, let's make an arc. So now I'm going to make a compass mark right there. Okay. Now let's call this, if I can, I'm going to call this point, move my compass out of the way. I'm going to call this A right here. And I'm going to call this B. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull my compass up and I'm going to move the needle over to B right there. Okay. And then, and by the way, let's call this point, the vertex is called C. So we, we have some notation. There. And then I'm going to just take my compass. I'm going to unlock it. Don't have to have it locked now. And I'm just going to stretch it out. And then I'm just going to make a mark out here. And I, I kind of like to get it a little bigger. I'm just going to make it so it covers pretty much that. See that? Now I'm going to lock my compass and then I'm going to take that needle and I'm going to put it up on A. And then I'm going to move my compass like that. And I'm just going to make a mark just like that. So remember where the compass got locked is the distance when I moved out in B, I locked it and did the same thing. Now let me get rid of my compass and let's just call this point right here D. Let's call this point D right here. Where the, and the, when I say D, it's where the two arcs meet. It's kind of like arc. When two arcs cross, they cross at a point. When two lines cross, they cross at a point. Same thing. And so now I'm going to hit my line maker tool. I'm going to start at C. And I'm going to make a, a line through CD. And what I've done is I bisected an angle. So this line or segment or ray or whatever you want to call it, whatever we want to decide it is, is a angle bisector. Now, if an, if a, if a, ray or a line bisects an angle, then it should have two equal measures. So let's measure these. So let me put my protractor on this. Okay, I'll move it up here. It looks like this angle right here, 21 degrees maybe. See that? A little bit past 20, not almost at 21. Okay, so let's move it down here. Let's see. Uh, down here like that. Again, 21 degrees. So we can now say that segment or ray CD bisects angle, segment CD bisects angle ACB. So I also want you, if you have some time, play around with this a little bit because I'm going to be calling my kids tomorrow. And what I, my goal is to have you guys share your screen and then you guys can um, show us how to angle bisect. Okay, so try that, review, rewind it if you need to, whatever. and. Um, Tomorrow, I want you guys to be able to do some uh, angle bisectings with when I call on you guys. Okay, so be ready to do that. Guys, have a wonderful day. We'll see you Tuesday, and I'll be putting a lot of grades in. So if you have any problems with your grades, uh, email me a little bit later in the day, and hopefully I'll have it all in the computer and queue. See you later. Bye.